Hi all, welcome to Casey Young Adult BSF. I'm grateful to get the opportunity to be in the Word with you and reflect on um, the disastrous chapters we read this week. To be blunt, the people in Genesis, they suck at times, but we know that all scripture is God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16, and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Reading these chapters is almost like watching a reality TV show. You want to love and cheer on the characters, but their charitable choices continue to make it hard to love them. However, before we get started, it's good to remind ourselves that Genesis was not written to glorify and make idols of the patriarchs and matriarchs of our faith. Instead, Genesis was written to show God's big love for his people, he, his continued forgiveness of heinous human sin, and his perfect plan always coming to fruition even when we struggle against his will. Let me pray for us before we get started. Father, we come before you and ask for your presence to be with us as we explore these chapters together. I pray that you would be with me as I speak over your word, that the words you want me to say would be pleasing and glorifying to you. Lord, be with us as we not only examine your scripture, but examine our hearts through these difficult chapters. Amen. Our first division for tonight is Genesis 34, Dinah and the Shechemites. This chapter of scripture is gut-wrenching and not for the faint of heart. We meet up with Jacob and his family outside of Shechem. Jacob had not followed Esau to be with his family, but instead gone to a different part of Canaan. We don't know why Jacob made that decision, but we do know that this started these awful events. As we further explore this chapter, it is important to note that God is not mentioned in this chapter. With that being said, let's go ahead and read the first couple verses and dive in. Now Dinah, the daughter Leah, had born to Jacob, went out to visit the women of the land. When Shechem, son of Hamor the Hivite, the ruler of that area, saw her, he took her and violated her. His heart was drawn to Dinah, daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. Genesis 34, 1 through 3. As mentioned before, it's pretty heart-wrenching. We know that Dinah was about 14 to 15 years old when these events took place. We don't know why she was by herself, but this story makes me sick and sad that not only did this happen in biblical times, but that it happens now. Currently in our culture, we see an increased awareness to the victims of sexual assault and listen to their story. However, for Dinah, that was not the case. We do not hear personally from her, but more we hear from the men around her and how they responded in many different ways. The five men that we're going to talk about are Jacob, Shechem, Hamor, Simeon, and Levi. Let's first talk about Jacob's response. Actually, there's not much to talk about. We learn in verse 5 that Jacob chose to keep quiet about it. Jacob's sons were out with the livestock, so instead of defending his daughter, he chose to not rock the boat and kept quiet about the incident. You might be wondering, just like I am, why Jacob did not respond. We do not get a specific answer, but we can speculate. Maybe Jacob did not respond to Dinah because he was scared of what he would lose. He had just moved to the area and bought a plot of land. He did not have an army of men, though Esau did offer, so he would have relied on his sons to protect his wealth. It is clear to us that Jacob cared more about what it would cost him to speak up on his daughter's behalf than Dinah's dignity. In this situation, Jacob wanted to lay low and not get involved. Those that chose to look at the other way or do nothing to keep their power and prosper from the situation are part of the issue that we witness. Because Jacob did not stand up for Dinah, his sons made the choice to respond. But before we talk about their response, let's talk about Shechem and Hamor's response. What Shechem did was not okay. Rape is devaluing a individual and stripping them of their sexual purity. This sin is not okay no matter the culture or time, which we see clearly in this chapter. I think the worst part about Shechem's response is that he wanted to marry Dinah and act like nothing happened. In verses 11 through 12, Shechem even offers Jacob a large dowry for his daughter because he obviously thinks money will just make the situation that much better. God doesn't want Shechem to cover up his actions with money or sweet talk. God wants him to confess his sins and own up to his actions, which would be accepting the consequences. 
Just like God expects that from Shechem, he expects that from us. God knows that since the fall, humans have a tendency to commit sins. But as believers, we know that God is the only solution to the destruction of sin. If we do not understand that the root of sin is in each of our hearts, then we will struggle with confessing and repenting our sins. When we sin, only Jesus can take our sins and replace it with his perfect sinlessness. However, Shechem thought that his money and power could take away the sin that he had committed. He even convinced his father to go along with his detestable proposal. Hamor said to Jacob and his sons, My son Shechem has his heart set on your daughter. Please give her to him as his wife. Intermarry with us. Give us your daughters and take our daughters for yourself. You can settle among us. The land is open to you. Live in it, trade in it, and acquire property in it. Genesis 34, 8 through 10. Whoa. That is one way to cover up your sins. Not only does this sound like a messed up proposal, but we know that this proposal could change the path of God's chosen people. If Jacob and his sons choose to take their proposal, they would be assimilating with the Canaanites and the Israelites would have ceased to exist as God's chosen people. And you might and have been panicky as you continue to read in the following verses at Jacob's sons reply to his proposal. We see that in verses 13, it says that they replied deceitfully. They said to them, we can't do such a thing. We can't give our sister to a man who is not circumcised. That would be a disgrace to us. We will give our consent to you on one condition only, that you become like us, circumcising all your males. Then we will give you our daughters and take your daughters for ourselves. We'll settle among you and become one people with you. But if we will not agree, if you will not agree to be circumcised, we'll take our sister and go. Genesis 34, 14 through 17. At first glance, this probably seems like an awful idea. One that could cause God's perfect plans to come crashing down. But after reading on, we see that this response was even nastier than we had expected. After the Shechemites agreed to the proposal, they circumcised themselves and experienced a painful procedure. When they were in pain, Simeon and Levi went to the city, killed every male, looted the city by seizing their flocks, herds, donkeys, and everything else. They also carried off all their wealth, women, and children. Wow, this story got worse. Shechem's sin was just the worst beginning, but now Simeon and Levi's response may have been a military mastermind, but it was graceful, disgraceful, and disgusting. They used God's covenant with Abraham as a weapon to kill and gain wealth. We say that because Jacob did not respond, that his sons made the choice to respond. Their responses mimic how we have seen Jacob respond throughout the last couple of chapters, deceitful, we see this quality in Jacob's sons and see how he's imprinted on them. However, their response affected more than just their lice, but the Shechemites as well. Our principle for the first division is decisions have long-term consequences. Whether that be Jacob choosing to not go home and settle where the Lord had called him, or Shechem, whose choice to fall into sexual sin caused his own death, or, as we read later in Genesis, Simeon and Levi do not have the most glorified blessing. What is your reaction when someone sins against you? We read in Romans 12, 17 through 21, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to event, I will repay, says the Lord. One contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. As God's chosen people, Jacob and his sons were called to live lives that were set apart. They were called to show love and compassion to those that had wronged them and their family. As Christ followers, we are called to do the same. This does not dismiss the fact that Shechem's actions toward Dinah were disgraceful and wrong, but it is what the Lord calls us to do, to show the kind of love and forgiveness that Jesus showed on the cross. Forgiveness and loving our enemies is hard, hard work. It is not easy and can only be achieved through putting our faith in Jesus Christ. We know that the only hero we have is Jesus. He is the only one that can wash away our sins and create in us a pure heart that yearns to glorify and serve the Lord. He is the one that we should be turning to in the face of a crisis, not our own plans or ideas. 
He is the one that will protect us even we we have messed up big time. Which is just what he did for Jacob and his family as we move on to our next division. Genesis 35, 1-15, Jacob goes home. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God, who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. Genesis 35, 1 through 3. Chapter 35 has already begun very differently than chapter 34. First off, God is mentioned in the chapter, and secondly, Jacob seems to take charge of his family. We saw in Genesis 34 that Jacob was more of a statue in the corner than an important leader in his family. We're not sure why Jacob acted this way, but we saw the ramifications of his lack of response. So instead of being a statue, Jacob decided to be a strong man of God that we have started to see. Part of that was following God's command to leave Shechem and head to Bethel. Barnhouse says, the only cure for worldliness is to separate from it. Jacob had to leave Shechem and go to Bethel. There had to be a departure from one and a new direction and destination set. There was a new place for Jacob and his family to dwell. Along with departing Shechem and pulling his family away from the sin and disaster that had happened, Jacob also cleaned up his household's act. First, Jacob commanded them to get rid of their foreign gods. At this point, we can assume that the gods are from Laban's household, most likely the ones that Rachel stole from her father. We know that Jacob's children would have been inclined to have these foreign gods because their mother had them. However, when Jacob chose to stand up in his household, his family followed. Second, Jacob told his household to purify themselves and change their clothes. This is an important step because it was meant literally and as a symbol of spiritual change. In Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, it says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Jacob knew that to be pure before the Lord, that he and his household needed to purify their hearts and minds before the Lord. We see Jacob's household follow his lead by giving up their foreign gods and removing the rings from their ears that were considered pagan. Because Jacob followed the Lord's commands, the Lord protected them as they set out from Shechem and made their way to Bethel. Once in Bethel, Jacob built an altar to the Lord and God appeared to him again to bless him. Here we see the summary of how the Lord blessed Jacob. He renamed Jacob to Israel, blessed him as he increased in number into a nation, prophesied that a king would come from his line, and told him the land given to Abraham and Isaac would be his and his descendants. We see these covenant promises repeated throughout the line of Abraham. The Lord is in the work of keeping his promises. Even though Jacob did not have the best showing in Shechem and shouldn't have been there in the first place, the Lord still chose to bless him in more ways than one. God's great nation, his chosen people, will be called Israel, and Jacob had the high responsibility of bearing this name. Sepurgeon says the next thing that came of this was a confirmation to Jacob of his title of prince, which conferred dignity on the whole family. For a father to be a prince ennobles all the clan. God now puts upon them another dignity and nobility, which they had not known before, for a holy people are a noble people. Jacob showed his gratitude to the Lord in Genesis 35, 14 through 15. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. Jacob showed a heart of worship and gratitude to the Lord for his continued provision. When the Lord keeps his promises to you, how do you express your gratitude? Our principle for this division is God keeps his covenant with his people. How have you seen God keep his promises to you? Just like Jacob and his family, we are sinful people, but we know that the beauty of the cross is that if we repent our sins and seek forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ, that our sins are forgiven and we are seen pure in God's eyes. Not only does God bless Jacob, but we will see in the next division that he blesses Esau as well. The last division is Genesis 35, 16 through 36, 43. Jacob and Esau's descendants. 
We jump back into the word on a sad moment for Jacob. Then they moved on from Bethel. While they were there, still some distance from Ethra, Rachel began to give birth and had a great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Benoni, but his father named him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephra. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar, and to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. Genesis 35, 16 through 20. What a sad moment for Jacob. Losing his true love, Rachel. We see here that Rachel felt great sorrow as she breathed her final breaths, naming her son Benoni, which means son of my sorrows. We would think that Rachel would be rejoicing for another boy, but you can tell that her competition with Leah was nothing but futile. In mourning of his wife, Jacob wisely renames their son to Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. We can speculate that Jacob felt some connection with the son as a final link between him and Rachel, who he deeply loved. We see that Jacob ha had this strong love for Rachel as he buries her and marks her tomb. Even though Jacob had made his heart right with God, that did not mean that he would not experience great sorrow. Also, it did not mean that his family would not have more struggles as we move on to Genesis 35:22. While Israel was living in that region, Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah, and Israel heard of it. Well, that's gross. If you have forgotten, Bilhah is the mother of Dan and Nathali. Also, Reuben was the firstborn. I would expect the best conduct from him since he is the first in the line to receive the covenant. But here is his grievous sin that he committed against his father and entire family which is the reason why this verse is included, and it's pretty important, because through their sins, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi seem to get disqualify themselves for the high calling of Abraham's blessing. It will then be up to the fourth son, Judah, to bring forth the Messiah. We will not see this played out until the end of Genesis, but we do know that it probably played a role between the brothers' relationships with each other and Jacob. We end chapter 35 with the death of Isaac. We read that Isaac lived to be 180 years old and that together Jacob and Esau buried him. We see this correlation of the brothers coming together just as we did for the burial of Abraham with Isaac and Ishmael. And as we head into chapter 36, we see another list of descendants. You may have noticed that when there is an ancestry list, that there will be a new section of stories about to begin. Jacob and Esau's stories are coming to a close, and Joseph's story, Jacob and Rachel's son, is about to start. In this chapter, we see the account of Esau's descendants, who were to become the nation of, of Edom. How God blessed him and provided for him and his family. We read in Genesis 36, 6-8, Esau took his wives and sons and daughters and all the members of his household, as well as his livestock and all his other animals and all the goods he had acquired in Canaan, and moved to a land some distance from his brother Jacob. Their possessions were too great for them to remain together. The land where they were staying could not support them both because of their livestock. So Esau settled in the hill country of Seir. God had blessed Esau enough that he could not share land with Jacob. From Esau pleading with his father to give him a better blessing, we see God providing even though Esau did not follow his ways. We have seen God bless Ishmael and Esau even though they weren't God's chosen people and did not choose to follow him. Other than seeing how God provided for Esau, you may be wondering why would the author include this chapter in Genesis? Why might this be important to the Israelites? Stephen J. Cole from Bible.org sums it up well. Moses was writing to people who were about to conquer the land of Canaan. The Edomites, Esau's descendants, lived on the border of that land. When Israel had sought to pass over the land en route to Canaan, the Edomite king refused, even though Moses promised to pay for any, war, excuse me, any food or water they consumed. That's in Numbers 20, 14 through 21. Perhaps once Israel was established in this land, someone would say, let's teach those Edomites a lesson. But God commanded Israel not to provoke Edom and said that he would not give Israel any of their land. That's in Deuteronomy 2, 2 through 5. So Israel needed to know who these people were so that they would treat them as the Lord had commanded.
Reading this section as an Israelite, they would see the importance of not bothering the Edomites. The Israelites were also reminded to show compassion and love to Edom. In Deuteronomy 22.7, Do not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. God was very much protecting and providing for Esau and his descendants. However, we see some hints to violent people in Esau's descendants. From names meaning wicked, advantage, and names after a false god, we see that Esau's descendants would not follow God's standards. If you notice the list of kings were all overthrown, none of the king's sons inherited the throne, but instead were succeeded by another individual. We can learn from Esau's descendants that if we succeed by worldly standards, but fail with God, we fail where it really matters. God blessed Esau with material needs and descendants, but Esau did not turn to him. Where do you see God's blessing in your life? What is your response to these blessings? Our principle for this division is God blesses his people. As you walk through Esau's descendants, I hope you think about the many blessings that God has blessed you with and how you will act on them. While we're still on earth, we have a choice to wait patiently for God to fulfill his promises to us or to choose to prosper in the world and pursue secular success. Like we discussed before, if we succeed by worldly standards but fail with God, we have failed where it really matters. Whether we fail or succeed by worldly standards, if we succeed with God, we will have true and lasting success. What a wild ride. This sex isn't session. Oh, excuse me. Let's try that again. What a wild ride. This section of Genesis was a lot. I hope that you will see the majesty of the Lord throughout these chapters and be able to rest in his peace as you go throughout your week. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the many blessings. Lord, we thank you for your word and cautions and encouragement that we find there. I pray that we would rest in your word this week, Lord, and that we would think about the many blessings that you have surrounded us with. Lord, please keep us safe and healthy and bring us back here next week. Amen. Thank you for joining me and tune in next week as Connor Connor talks about Joseph's dream and we start to round out the last 13 chapters of Genesis. Mm -hmm.